Today on Outdoor Oklahoma, wildlife department biologists are involved in a variety of projects across the state that help to improve habitat and give them valuable information to make smart decisions. And today we'll look at a few of those projects right now on Outdoor Oklahoma. Hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead and today I'm spending a little time reminiscing, so to speak, down here at Lexington Wildlife Management Area. And Lexington really kind of holds a special place in my heart because it was really about, oh, another hundred yards down at a pond where I shot my very first duck and I'll, I'll never forget it. It was about 20 years ago and it was a hooded merganser of all things. You know, with as green as everything is right now, it's hard to imagine that this area was just recently burned just a few months ago by our biologists. You know, prescribed burning is really one of the most cost-effective and widely used management tools that our biologists use to help manipulate wildlife habitat. Well, I'm now joined by Bill Dinkins, our Assistant Chief of our Wildlife Division. And, and Bill, your division is, is in charge of having to manage over a million acres of land for public use across Oklahoma. And fire is a big component of that management, isn't it? Oh, fire is by far our most efficient management tool. Now, uh, fire has been around and part of the natural environment for a long, long time. And it's really only in recent history where we've had to kind of use it as a tool, so to speak. That's, that's correct. I mean, you look back in history and, and fire played a big, big part in uh, shaping the landscape. You know, I, in fact, I know stories of how Native Americans even used it as a tool. They knew the value Absolutely. Uh, of, of burning. Now, we call it prescribed burning. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me, you know, first off, why, why do we put that kind of label on it, and then why is it so important? Well, we call it prescribed burning, Todd, because we set a prescription. There's certain parameters and criteria uh, as land managers. Uh, everybody has to set their objective, and once you do that, you know, you have certain parameters to burn to reach those objectives. And, and when I say parameters, I'm referring to like wind speed, uh, relative humidity, and things like that. So you, you referenced fire as a tool so what do we actually gain out of burning an area? Well, Todd, as you know, Oklahoma is a very diverse state. Um, southeast Oklahoma averages about 60 inches of rainfall a year compared to like northwestern Oklahoma, probably less than 20 inches. <laughs> so, for example, in the southeast where you get that, that amount of rainfall, you're obviously going to get a lot of vegetation growth. And the fire helps us set back that succession, you know, reduce that, that component and it stimulates new growth, which is basically a uh, natural food plot, if you will. So it, it, in a way, it kind of takes away or eliminates the elements of the, the landscape that are not beneficial and then encourages or promotes the natural growth of species that are beneficial? Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> as I mentioned, each, each area manager will have an objective. And, and, and you may have an area where you have eastern red cedar encroachment. And the best tool, the most efficient tool uh, to control those or remove them is through prescribed burning. Well, I'm sure that there's probably, you know, quite a few Oklahomans that 
would be interested in being able to use this same tool. We use it a lot on our WMAs, uh, but but it's not something that you just do every single year, though, is it? No, not not generally. You know, for our management areas, um, probably a three to five year rotation is what we use. In other words, in in that time frame, uh, the area managers block it into components or compartments, sorry, and try to burn certain compartments, but in a five-year rotation, they would like to have burnt the whole area. You don't want to go in and just, you know, burn the whole area at once. Okay. Uh, you got to leave, leave certain components of nesting cover, fawning cover, etc. And if you just go in and slick it off, then there's, there's obviously no cover there. That's right. Um, and then out of that over a million acres that we manage, roughly about on an annual basis, how many do we, do we burn? How many acres? Well, on good years, I mean, this, this past year, um, we, we burnt probably around 100,000 acres. Uh, the problem is there's a very small window of opportunity for us to do that. You know, uh, through the fall, we have our deer hunters in the woods. Mm -hmm. And as, you, as, as uh, the calendar rolls over to January, January, February, March are typically the three months that we target. And as you know, the weather in Oklahoma is very unpredictable. <laughs> So we had to work around that. Now, Bill, although we don't actually conduct burns on private property, we do have some resources available for uh, landowners that are interested in doing it themselves, right? Absolutely. We, we have some dedicated staff that are uh, there to provide technical assistance to private landowners for wildlife management and advise on burning as needed. That's great. You know, I can imagine that conducting a burn would be pretty stressful on our biologists and, and they do that every year. But another one of the annual activities that our wildlife biologists are involved in that's a little less stressful is the annual banding of resident geese and we like to call it our goose roundup. <laughs> Identifying the sex of the, the Canada geese here and a little bit of technique and holding them and get them around secure where they don't flop. You have to bend the tail back to protrude the cloacal opening there and you'll be looking at either a penis there or a female. We have a, a male, adult male. And see if we can get a female here in a second. Usually a little smaller bird, maybe a female. <laughs> Holding the legs, because uh, they can scratch. They got pretty good claws on them, other than flapping you with the feathers. And open up that cloacal area, and it looks like a female there. That's all there is to it. Well, this time of year, uh, late June, early July, we're working on banding some of our resident population of uh, Canada geese. We do it statewide. Today we happen to be working here in Oklahoma City. At this time of year, a lot of these birds are flightless. They'll have a lot of their flight feathers have already fallen out and working on growing back in. So they're incapable of sustained flight right now. So it makes it easier for us to round these birds up, uh, get them into get them into a pen like this where we can actually work them up. When we have birds in a pen, we have a federally issued nine digit band that we'll put on. Each band has a unique number to it, a unique identifier number. Uh, that band, when it's found by another birder or shot by a hunter, can be reported. And it gives us an idea on, first off, where these birds are traveling. So a lot of these birds in here right now, a lot of what we're trying to catch is young birds as well. So we know they're Oklahoma birds, but we kind of want to know where they go when they grow up, whether they actually stay here or whether they disperse out to some of the other surrounding states. So the, this unique nine digit band number allows us to track these birds through their lifetime. Uh, it also gives us a way in future years, we can use this data to come up with population estimates uh, based off of just the banding data. Usually we try to work our banding program pretty well every, every section of the state. Uh, we'll usually hit about six or seven 
uh, sites or areas around the state. Uh, each site may have, you know, two, three, four different lakes that will hit there. Oh, you know, it's a chance for people to come out and see actual wildlife management, you know, going on. Get out, get a little dirty, actually grab some animals. It's also a good chance to get kids out. You know, there's a lot of excitement. Rounding up the geese is a little bit fun for them, but you know, chasing the geese down, they really enjoy that. Well, just like our wildlife division, our fisheries division is also involved in many annual projects as well as some long-term projects like this one here. This is Dahlgren Lake on Lexington Wildlife Management Area near Noble. They've recently begun to drain the lake so they can begin a major renovation project here and turn Dahlgren into a premier fishing destination. I recently had a chance to sit down with the Assistant Chief of Fisheries, Ken Cunningham, and find out more about the long-term plans they have for many of our wildlife department lakes. So Ken, you know, we're involved in management in most every lake across the state, but the wildlife department specifically owns 16 lakes across the state, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Todd. Uh, like you said, we are involved in management of pretty much every public water in Oklahoma, but these 16 lakes uh, the department owns, and so that gives us a lot more flexibility as far as what we do and, and, and what, how we better manage those uh, lakes. Plus the fact that they're all relatively small. It's easier to manage a small lake as opposed to a large lake like Grand or Ten Killer or right. Texoma. Now, we've, we've started these restoration projects a few years ago on, and we've got a few under our belt so far right right that's correct so we've uh, those projects have ranged from anywhere from uh, a, a complete dam overhaul on American horse to relatively smaller uh, fishing access improvements on lakes like uh, Carl Atling and uh, and uh, Elmer Thomas well good now when it comes to the remaining lakes what what kind of are your objectives and what do you hope to accomplish by with these renovations? Well, it really depends on the lake. Uh, for example, a lake like Dahlgren, where we're drawing that down completely, we, we want to try to dig that out a little bit and improve the, uh, the, the uh, habitat uh, of the, you know, the lake bottom. Uh, but we're primarily involved in smaller projects like fishing access, uh, boating access, uh, parking lots and those types of projects on some of the other lakes statewide. Well, that's great. You know, this is really, I guess, a chance for your division to show off their expertise with these smaller department-owned lakes and really turn them into kind of showcase models. Yeah, yeah, and that's our intention. We want to we want to make these showcase fisheries for the state and for Oklahomans. So, Ken, many of our wildlife department-owned lakes are 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 older. For instance, I noticed at Dahlgren now that it's being drained down. It's pretty shallow looking too, so I guess that's an opportunity to do something work, work there. Right. So you know, Dahlgren was built in 1953, and as the older lakes are, the more they silt in. So that's part of, uh, and of course, that affects fish habitat, fish productivity, the number of fish in the lake, which affects uh, angling opportunities. And so the idea is that we draw it down, uh, we we dig it out, we uh, uh, refurbish the lake, get better habitat in there, which improves fishing. And uh, so, you know, we realize that these, these uh, department lakes are important to local anglers, 
um, and that it's a it's an inconvenience to have this lake closed for a couple of years. Uh, but but the but the long term gains are going to be are, are going to far outweigh any short term inconvenience. That's great. You know your division is involved in in lots of other types of long term projects as well as some annual short term things that come up every year. And what are some of those things that your division does every year? Well, we. We, uh, in addition to habitat work, we do surveys, uh, we uh, stock fish, you know, our, all four of our fish hatcheries are involved in raising fish and stocking those out on an annual basis. We're involved in annual research projects. So, so yeah, lake renovation and habitat work is really just a, a small part of what we do statewide. Well, you mentioned habitat work and we're going to be now joining up with a team of our fisheries guys down at Okima and they're going to be putting in some brand new habitat on that lake to improve that fishery. Okima Lake down here in South Central Oklahoma. Lake, there's actually two lakes together. There's actually the old lake back over here that was originally here and then when they built this new one they just knocked a hole through the dam on the old one and, and connected the two. It's one of our better bass lakes in the state. It has a lot of tournament pressure on it. We've had some of our kayak tournaments over here. but I haven't got to do as much habitat work as I'd like to over here. So the kayak guys contacted me, said they wanted to do a project. I'm Rusty and I'm with uh, one of the Oklahoma kayak anglers and work with the uh, Northeastern Oklahoma kayak anglers group. Um, came out here to help really uh, make our fisheries better and help Danny out. Danny's such an important part of our group and helps us out and he asked for help and we wanted to come out and do what we could to help out. I'm Jim Marsh, I'm with Oklahoma Bass Nation. I'm the conservation director for the Oklahoma chapter. We're here today helping the wildlife department sink brush piles at Akima Lake. Uh, cedars is a good way to get used cedars up because we're trying to get rid of them and it's a good place to put them, sink them in the lakes, add fish habitat. Our club, North OKC Bassmasters, fished Fort Cobb a few years ago. And everything we caught, we caught out of the cedar trees. That was part of the Wildlife Department's project for out there. Yeah, so we come out and we use this lake. Uh, we've held some tournaments out here in the past, and uh, um, it's a great, great lake, great fishery. Um, this is the first time that I've actually had a chance to come out and help throw out some, uh, some cedar trees and, you know, make the brush piles better. But um, I think it's something that I don't know, it's passionate to me because it's a great sport, it's healthy for our environment, and it's, it's a future for our kids. We found that cedars are probably one of the better trees that we can use. They got a lot of spaces in between them, small spaces for forage fish to hide. We've also got a lot of surface area for plankton to grow on it. Most people want rid of them because they're an invasive species, kind of. Uh, they're glad you let you come out and cut all you want. So they work really well, they last well underwater. Uh, using Fort Cobb back as an example, it gave the place for fishermen to go fish and find fish easily instead of them getting offshore and just kind of suspended. And it made for a really great fishery, a really great tournament when the water's up in the cedars. We fished it as a, with a club with North OKC a few years ago. And first time ever showed up, it was one of our mystery lakes. We don't know where we're going ahead of time. And we had 25 pounds that day, which is a good stringer of bass anywhere in Oklahoma without ever seeing the lake. And every single fish came out of the cedar trees. And we're hoping here we can get the same type of results and help get that year class up with the planting of cedar trees. I've had help from Wildlife Division with Bruce, uh, Bruce Burton and Steve Bray. I had Nathan Erdman from Law Enforcement come and help. 
I had Robert Reese, our habitat coordinator, come and help. And Don Groom, my supervisor, came from Higgins' office and helped. We've been cutting, cutting and hauling trees all week. Well, we decided to volunteer out here on this Saturday um, because Danny Bowen posted up on our Facebook page about um, putting in fish, or fish habitat to help the largemouth population out at Okima Lake. Um, and it was kind of a no-brainer. You get to kind of get to know where the spots are where they're putting the trees out. Uh, we put in uh, a lot of cedar trees. I think we put in over 90 out here at several different uh, fish, fish marker locations. And those, I think some of those will be available on the website, on the Wildlife Department's website here in the future. No, Akima is a great fishing lake. It has decent quality size. The average is great. It has declined over the years, and some of that's due to pressure, some of it's due to habitat loss along the shorelines. Um, one of the things, it's a water willow lake, and there's not a lot of stuff offshore. And the cedar trees are going to help that and provide safe haven for the small fish to grow in a thick offshore, not being picked off by predators quite as easy. Um, they've done a great job managing the lake. The city has with the Wildlife Co Corporation. Now, we've actually held a tournament out here at Okima Lake. Uh, our first uh, year that we held uh, kayak fishing tournaments in 2012, and we had a with the. Uh, the, the marker buoys that were out here and the trees that were out here actually played a really big role in who, who ended up winning out here. And again, we're North OKC Bassmasters as part of the Oklahoma Bass Nation. You can find us on the web at northokc.com. And we're always looking for members. We meet the first Tuesday of the month at Camps 910 Cafe, and all of our tournaments are within an hour and a half of Oklahoma City. Well, uh, the Oklahoma Kayak Anglers is a kayak fishing tournament trail put together by kayak fishermen for kayak fishermen. and we. Uh, we fish all over the state. We're mainly based out of Oklahoma City and Tulsa, but we, um, we fish just about everywhere. We go down there to Broken Bow, um, just any corner of the state, anywhere there's water, you can get your kayak on out there. Um, we've, our, our format is a catch photo release format, so we use a digital camera and a hog trough for a measuring board, and we take pictures of the fish, and it's a five fish limit um, catch photo release. And then we come back and we weigh in at the ramp and we just get out there and we have a good time with everybody. Um, it's, it's, a, it's more about the camaraderie more so than it is about the fishing. Um, some of these guys here behind us, they're getting ready to go fish after we put in these trees and test out some of the new fishing structure we just put in. Uh, should be a good year this year, so if anybody wants to come out and fish with us, our Facebook page is the uh, Oklahoma Kayak Anglers. And we have a, a new forum that's up, that, or a forum that's up that you can find there on the, on the Facebook page. Well, I hope today that you now have a greater appreciation for the efforts that our wildlife and fisheries biologists go to to ensure that we all have wonderful outdoor experiences here in Oklahoma. Hey, thanks for joining us today. And for all of us at your wildlife department, I'm Todd Craighead, and we'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.